The topic of my webinar is going to be success during calving season. I've put together a list of essential supplies that I think are necessary during calving season, as well as some strategies for when you should assist that cow and when to call for help. So let's start with the supplies. The first thing I have is an actual toolbox. This is a lightweight toolbox. It's portable. It lives in the same place every year so that everyone on my farm knows where it's at. The most important thing inside this toolbox is going to be your veterinarian's contact information. This is just a picture of my card that's taped to it. This is essential so that everyone knows who to call when an emergency would happen. One trick that I would say is, especially if you vet at a multi-doctor practice, that you go into that practice before calving season and you introduce yourself to everyone that's there. You want to make sure that there's a face to the name that answers the phone and it's not a surprise at two in the morning. It's a whole lot easier to make a connection in the afternoon than it is during an emergency. So the first thing that's inside my toolbox is a halter and a long rope or a lariat. This is important. The halter, we all know we use that to put on the head of the calf, but especially in heifers, if that heifer is small, she could possibly slip her head out of the, the head catch. So we want to make sure that she's safe as well as you are safe. A lot of times there's not a lot of room between you and the back wall. The other reason I use a long rope is to actually cast this cow to lay down. So this is an example of how to cast a cow. If, if you've never done it, I probably wouldn't recommend that you start in the middle of a dystocia. However, it's not that intimidating once you figure it out. So you make a little loop and you put it around the neck loosely of the cow like it's in this illustration. And then we're going to do a half hitch right behind those front legs and do another half hitch right in front of the udder. The way that that long rope st sticks out the back, then you can actually pull on that rope and that will help lay that cow down. You don't always need to do that, but we do know that the natural way that a cow gives birth is by laying down. She has stronger contractions. Her hip will actually start to rotate into the normal position so that we can prevent any sort of hip lock. And it's obviously more comfortable for the cow. Now, if the other reason I will use that rope is to restrain a leg. And this is important for when I go to milk her out because for two reasons. Number one, we don't want to get kicked. And number two, we don't want her to kick over that bucket of colostrum. That's very important. So the next thing that's inside my toolbox are some OB sleeves and lubrication. This is just a picture of a, of a gallon jug of generic lube that I use. Um, it, it comes in all different sizes. You may not need a whole gallon, but there's, there's never too much lube. So you definitely want to make sure that you have it available. One trick would be you can actually pour some of that into just a small squirt bottle that can fit right inside your toolbox. They also sell it in like toothpaste size tubes, and that's convenient to, to go as well. I put a picture of my sleeves on here because I want you to know that they come in different sizes. So I have small hands and small arms and they do come in small all the way up to large, but this is important so that I don't have a lot of material on the tips of my fingers when I go in there to do my exam. We use, you know, we use our fingers to see everything that's in there and I want to make sure that I can feel things well. So disinfectants are very important. This is a picture of two that I use. One is a chlorhexidine solution and the other is a betadine scrub. These are very concentrated and I will dilute them into warm water. The way that I use them is I fill a stainless steel bucket that's clean with nice warm water and then I will put some of the solution in the bucket. Then I take that bucket and I will actually clean the entire back end, the perineal region of the cow. We want to limit any sort of manure that we're going to be putting into the birth canal. That can be a little difficult, but it definitely helps to get some of that out of the way before you introduce your arm. The second thing that that's good for is it actually will desensitize the cow so that you don't get kicked. So cleaning her off is a, is a nice tip before you just go in to do your exam. You don't necessarily need to have these you know, these advanced uh, disinfectants. If you want to just use some, some mild dish soap and water and dilute it in there, that is a good thing to have as well. So chains and straps. Um, inside that bucket, after I have used the disinfectant, I will put clean water and disinfectant back in it, and that's where my chains will live, so they're ready to go. I like chains over straps for a couple reasons. Number one, my chains, I feel like I can get them cleaner, better than a strap. Um, it, it definitely doesn't hold all that extra birth material on there quite as much as a strap will. But um, you can, whatever your preference is, is fine. But the other biggest reason that I like chains is because it can create that half hitch like is shown in this picture here. So you can see that right here I've got a loop over the fetlock 
of the leg of the calf and then I will half hitch it again. And this is very important because that actually helps distribute the amount of tension that's on that foot. And there's also a growth plate that lives right in there which is just a joint that will start to spread as that calf gets bigger. And we don't want to do any sort of damage to that growth plate because if it were to break we could have detrimental effects for the lifetime of that calf. Okay. Towels and rags are, are an important essential tool to have inside your box as well. Um, obviously, if we've pulled this calf, we want to make sure that we go to help kind of stimulate it and clean it off just like the mom would. So the biggest thing about using that towel to vigorously rub on that calf is it's actually going to stimulate the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve is a big nerve that goes into the diaphragm, which is just a big muscle that separates the abdomen from the chest. And once that's been stimulated, it helps those lungs inflate and that calf will take a breath. Another trip that tick, trick that you guys probably already know is to take some straw or your finger and to stimulate the inside of the nostril. This helps to stimulate that gasping reflex, then also helps them to take a breath. One other little trick that I use is an actual acupunc acupuncture site. So right in the nasal planum of this little guy, right in the middle of the nose, it's just soft tissue. If you take a 22 gauge needle, and you perpendicularly place that right into the nose and give it a little twist, it will stimulate the central nervous system so that they also take a breath. This doesn't help every single time, but it doesn't hurt as long as your needle's small enough. Make sure you're not sticking in a large 14 gauge needle into a newborn baby. So medications are important to have in your toolbox. I'm not going to discuss which medications I think are the most important because that's one that needs to be established with you and your veterinarian. However, what I do want you to remember is to check those expiration dates. Maybe you haven't used those medications since last year, um, so if they've been expired, we need to replace them. And also, we want to check for any sort of extreme temperatures. So if they were frozen or if they were exposed to very high temperatures, that can actually denature or cause the medication to not work as well, and so you want to get rid of those. One little hint is ox oxytocin is actually labeled to stay in the refrigerator up to around 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So after that calf is born, best calving practices include identification. This is definitely up to you as a rancher and what technique you like to use. But I think that a good idea would be to have a visual ID that matches the calf and the dam. You can put on that whatever, whatever best suits your you know, your ranch, um, but it's also a good time to possibly get a DNA sample. You can use a, a TSU or you can also put in an EID. Uh, the next slide I'll show you, there is a, on this slide here, there's a picture to show you that these do come together in a group. You can get that 840 tag with your premise number, so then that life, the life of the calf will be actually um, tracked through, through the whole life so that it's to your farm and you know where it comes from. One trick or one suggestion that I always follow is that that calf needs to make sure that it has nursed and mothered up with its mom before you go messing with it to do anything. The most important thing in that calf is that it gets that colostrum. And if we go interfere when the calf is, uh, hasn't had that chance to bond, we could possibly be setting it up for failure for the rest of its life. The other thing, if you're going to do a DNA sample, you want to make sure that that calf is dry. If that calf is still wet and has any sort of the mom's DNA still on it, that will interfere with your TSU and your DNA sample. And also tattoo ink can also mess with that, so make sure if you are going to do a DNA sample that you do that before you tattoo. Another good practice after calving is record keeping. Um, record books are going to be definitely designed to whatever program fits your needs. It could be anywhere from you know your little calf Bible that you keep with you all the time to some advanced computer program. Whatever you choose, just make sure that you utilize the information that's put in there. It won't do any good if you keep all these records but you don't look at them again. Suggestions for which records that I like to keep would obviously be the identification of the calf and the dam. Um, birth date is extremely important for a couple reasons. Um, obviously if they're registered calves we want to know age. But also, research has shown that if you have a heifer that you want to retain in your herd, if she was born in that first 21-day cycle, she's going to cycle earliest, get bred first, and then calve first the next season for you. So in turn, she's going to give you a longer a longevity in your herd and give you more calves, which is going to equal more money for you. Um, it's also important to make sure that you know the beginning of calving season and the end of calving season so that you can look at calving duration. This is important to look at later in the year if you're trying to sync that up to try to get that, that to be shorter. 
I also think it's important to have a body condition score of your dam at calving. Multiple reasons for this, you can look at it later in the year when it's easier to manipulate nutrition, such as in the fall after weaning when their nutritional requirements are low. If we need to increase her body condition, that would be a good time. But also, at the meantime, during birth, if that, if that body condition score is low on that cow, this is a time that we need to identify her and make sure that she's got the nutrients that she needs so that she can continue to lactate and make the right milk for that baby. I think it's important to put calving score on. Um, this is just, just to say, did you pull the calf? Was it done unassisted? Or did you have to do some serious manipulation? That's good if you're looking at culling in the future and also the genetics of that calf or possibly changing the, the sire dam a connection. Weight is important, especially if you're a seed stock producer. We want to have a birth weight on there for registration purposes. I put udder on here because you don't necessarily need to do an udder score at birth, but it's important to take a look at it and see if there is any sort of uh, environmental contaminants, manure, mud that's on that udder because we don't want that calf to have anything to interfere with that first colostral meal. And then lastly, noting calf vigor. This is important if that calf starts to get sick later in the year, if you did any treatments, if there was something that it just didn't seem like it was going, this will help you and your veterinarian to make your plan for any future treatments. So a few extras that are in my toolbox are a therm is, is a thermometer. Um, I like to use just a generic uh, human thermometer. You can get it from the drugstore. It's good to have a couple because usually one's not working or you lost it. Um, but that's really important to help you check the temperature of newborn calves to see if they're too cold and also to check as they get older if they've been sick. Some needle sizes that I like to use would be an 18 gauge 3 quarter inch for the babies and a 16 gauge 3 quarter inch for the moms. That's usually enough to get by. Um, disposable syringes, 6 and 12 cc's are usually cover what you need. Occasionally a 3 cc syringe might be necessary if you're doing something in smaller doses. I also like to have iodine available for the navel. Uh, I prefer to have mine in a squirt bottle. I think it's easier to use and then also it, it just keeps itself contained and doesn't seem to get too contaminated. And then we already discussed the importance of my stainless steel bucket. So outside of my toolbox, I do have a calf jack. And this is a tool that is, is fine to use as long as you know how to use it. Before calving season, you want to make sure that it's working properly. You want to make sure that, that cable is not frayed. And you also want to make sure that everybody knows how to use it. The biggest thing is that understanding when a calf can be pulled by using this technique. Remember that a calf should only be pulled with the strength of two adults. So if you go to put on, if it's you and another person and you're pulling that calf and you're not making any progress, a calf jack is not the answer at that point. It needs to come a different way or you need to get some help. But if it's just you and you need a little bit of help, a calf jack isn't a bad idea if you understand how to use the one that you have. The other thing to remember is that if two grown adults are pulling on that, the PSI strength can be about 500. But if you hook up a calf jack, it can get up to 1400 PSI, which is going to rip a calf in half and can damage a cow for life. Um, there is no release on a calf jack. So when, when you go to pull, you'll notice the normal technique of a cow giving birth is she goes to have a contraction and she pushes, and you pull when she pushes, and then she rests and you rest. Well, if you have a calf jack hooked up in full tension, there's no resting on that. So a lot of damage can be done. So just remember that you know how to use it, know when it's okay to use it, and then always remember when to stop using it. I also have a clean calf feeder um, in my toolbox. Make sure that if you lose, used it last year, there is no sort of residuals in it. it. If it's dirty, throw it away, get a new one. Also, if a calf has chewed on that tube, and if there's any sort of edges or, or roughness to it, get rid of it because that can cause damage to the esophagus. So this is a uh, this is a trick that can sometimes be a little intimidating, but it's a good idea to talk to your veterinarian before calving season and, and ask them for help if you do need a little assistance. I'll kind of walk you through how I do it. So normally a calf that needs to be tubed isn't standing. I, ideally, if they are standing, that's good. I'll stand them up and back them in a corner and straddle them to, to give them their colostrum. But most of the time, these guys aren't standing up because they're a little weak and they need some help. But I do want to make sure that they're sitting up sternal, which just means they're sitting up on their chest and they can hold their head up. So I will straddle the calf like I'm doing in this picture, and then I will reach down onto the neck and get a good feel of my landmarks. Those landmarks include your trachea, which is a hard 
you have hard cartilage rings in that trachea and it's firm. You can feel it. You can't feel the esophagus when there's nothing in it. So tell yourself where those are at before you put that calf tube in. Then I usually grab my hand down underneath of the calf's mouth and start to gently push that calf tube in while it swallows the tube. After I've got it swallowed, then I'll reach back down again and now you will feel two tubes. The, the esophagus tube should be on the left side. If you're not 100% sure still, keep your hand on the neck and move that tube up and down. Most calf feeders have a little ball at the end and you can move, feel that moving up and down and then you know you're in the right spot. Once you're confident that you're in the right spot, go ahead and gently tip up that bottle to allow the colostrum to go into the stomach. One tip, one tip to remind you is that these calves will usually start to move and vocalize as soon as that colostrum hits their stomach. It's a stimulus and be prepared for that. So let's talk just a little bit about colostrum because I think this is a very important uh, strategy for you to understand and understand why, why we need it. Um, so let's kind of review why it is needed. The first thing, remember, a bovine placenta is very unique. It prevents any sort of the blood from mixing with the calf during gestation. So it doesn't get the chance to pass any of its antibodies through the blood. It's really cool that the cows actually will take their antibodies and deposit it into their colostrum. So that's why colostrum is so important for this calf. When they're born, there is no immune system. So think of them like a blank slate. The only way they're gonna get that immunity is if they go to take that first meal from mom. So FPT stands for failure of passive transfer. Failure of passive transfer has been studied multiple times and it's been shown that you're gonna have an increased risk of neonatal and pre-weaning morbidity and mortality. So they're gonna get sick more often. But also, it follows them if they make it through that first neonatal period. If they get into the feed yard, you're going to have a decreased weaning weight and also a decrease in average daily gain. So colostrum is very important to set that calf up for success. So what exactly is in colostrum? Well, the process of making colostrum is called colostrogenesis, and this actually begins several weeks before the calf is even born. This is really important to understand because as, in, for a couple examples, number one, if you're in a lot where you've got heifers and you might have one that's robbing or you've got a newborn calf that's robbing off of a mama, there's potential that that new baby is starting to take some of the colostrum from that baby that's not born yet. So definitely want to separate those. But it's also important to remember this because whatever she has at birth is all that calf is going to have. And it's kind of a ticking time bomb. So we'll go over time frame in a little bit. But what, what else is in this colostrum includes antibodies called IgG1. This is an immunoglobulin that helps start that immunity for that calf. It's very unique that the calf has, can actually absorb those antibodies in its intestines. So you think of the intestines kind of like a leaky sieve and those antibodies can pass through into the calf's system and start to circulate and protect it. In addition to IgG, it also contains leukocytes. Leukocytes activate cell-mediated immunity, and this basically is just the calf's way of telling the cells in its body to turn on and start to protect it from different pathogens that it could experience. In addition to the immunity support, it also has fat and energy. This is very important for thermoregulation. So a lot of these calves are going to be born in January, February. The, the environment is not super warm, and they need that extra uh, fat and energy to give them that vigor to get up and get going. It also contains vitamins A and E. We know vitamin E is a good antioxidant, and then they both are immunostimulants, just meaning that it helps support that immune system in that calf. So what are some things that could possibly prevent the transfer of colostrum to get to that calf? Well, the first thing would be that that mama cow just is not making enough colostrum, not making enough antibodies. Research has shown that body condition score is directly related to quality of colostrum. This chart that I have here shows the body condition score ranging from 2 to 6, and then you also can see the concentration of the IgG in the serum of calves at 24 hours of age. It increases at body condition score increases. The second thing that could possibly prevent some colostrum quality would be parity. So older cows who have been exposed to more pathogens, more seen more things in their life, uh, will have a higher quality colostrum than a heifer. And then finally, possibly that cow just isn't making antibody production. Perhaps she's been sick herself and her immune system isn't working quite as well. So that would prevent the, the quality of colostrum being made. 
So in the summary of the production would definitely be we're looking for an older cow in good body condition score that's healthy and had a good vaccine status and she's going to have your best colostrum. So what else could prevent transfer? Environmental contamination is a concern and it can actually compete with the absorption of the IgG. It's interesting that the bacteria like those absorption sites in the intestines just as much as the IgG does. So if we do have a calf that goes to nurse on that udder that I had discussed earlier that does possibly have manure on it, that calf will get a mouthful of bacteria or pathogens and it will compete and close those absorption sites before they get the needed antibodies that are there. So timing is very important too. We've kind of touched on how, how important it is to get that colostrum into the calf. I have a couple different points here. One would be on the cow side that shows for every hour after that cow has calved, there was a 3.7% decrease in the amount of colostrum in the IgG. So the clock starts at birth and it slowly starts to go down after that. And then on the calf side, for every 30 minutes that there's a delay in that calf taking its colostrum meal, we're gonna have a reduction of two grams per liter of IgG in that calf serum. So my rule of thumb is that calf should have had a colostrum meal by four hours. Um, four to six, six is probably cutting it, but when we get to 12 hours, we have known that the absorption sites in the intestine are actually shut down by half. When you get to 24 hours, we have complete gut closure, which means there's no more chance for that calf to get its antibodies through the absorption in the intestines. So this is why it's important to not interfere with that mothering up ability when they're first born, because we want to make sure that they get that meal. So a couple other things that can cause an issue with transfer would be dystocia. Um, any sort, anytime there's trauma in birth, this is gonna re lead to acidosis. Acidosis is just a buildup of carbon dioxide, which then leads to lactic acid, and it, makes, it depresses the immune system. So it makes those dummy calves, those really weak calves, and then we, they aren't gonna have the ability to get up and get that colostrum meal. There was a research study done where a weak suckle reflex actually led to a 41 times greater odds of failed colostrum consumption. So this is a really simple test that you can do on the ranch where you just find a baby calf and you stick your fingers in its mouth and see if it starts to kind of chew or nurse on your fingers. If it's got a strong suckle reflex, then we've got a good, a good base for that calf to, to be able to get up and have a strong vigor. If there is nothing there, or if it's cold or dry, then we need to intervene, and I would definitely be getting this baby some colostrum myself to make sure that it got it. And in addition, that leads into hypothermia. Again, if you feel that the mucous membranes in the mouth are cold, the nose is cold and dry, we need to get that calf in and warmed up. So how much colostrum do you need? Recent research has shown that his, the greater the amount of the IgG, the better. Um, the most recent that I found was uh, 280 to 300 grams total of colostral IgG mass needed in that first six hours of life. Um, for reference, a, a good body condition score of, of a beef cow that's been exposed to several things in your herd should have an average of 95 grams per liter. So three liters of colostrum this calf will need by the time it's six hours old. The best source of colostrum is gonna be the cow. If you don't, have the ability to get colostrum from the cow if something went wrong then there's a couple different options. My second best option would be a donor cow from your herd. Possibly you had a cow that lost her calf and you milked out the colostrum. You can keep that and freeze it in gallon bags and lay it flat in your freezer and it can stay for a year and then when you thaw it out you'll actually warm it in uh, water that's no more than like 100 degrees and slowly warm that back up to room temperature. Make sure that you do not microwave that because the microwave will cause issues and denature the proteins in it. But if you don't have the cow and you don't have a donor cow, then there are a lot of powdered supplements that are on the market. This is just a picture of a couple that I have used before. The most important thing I want you to remember is you need to read the package. Because there are a lot of options on the market, they all contain different amounts of IgG and or additive um, things in them, such as E. coli antibodies. It, the, the biggest pull it would be price. So you might notice that a supplement, a, a powdered supplement, is going to be significantly less expensive than a replacer. And that's because it has significantly less IgG. So remember, if we don't have any source of colostrum except for this, that calf needs to get almost 300 grams. So if I was going to use 
uh, this Ultra Start that has 150 grams, we definitely need to be mixing that up two bags worth within that six hours. But you need to, you need to understand how much is there. The other thing that is a trick um, that I think is okay is that you can go ahead and milk out your cow or your heifer. If you don't have enough that's there but you want to give that calf a little bit more, it's okay to mix products as long as you're mixing it properly from the back of the bag. I have a whisk in this picture that I use, but I think a blender is a great idea too. A lot of people will have a blender that they keep around just to mix up um, calf milk replacer or colostrum supplements. So let's talk just a little bit about the stages of labor and some strategies of knowing when to intervene and to call for help. So there's three stages of labor. The first stage of labor would be where that cervix starts to dilate. This is when the calf will move into position, the cervix softens, that cow may be walking around restless, she's pacing, she's flagging her tail. Um, you might notice urination and defecation increasing, or you might not notice it at all. A lot of times this goes undetected. The timing can vary greatly anywhere from two hours up to, to a full day, 24 hours. The second stage of labor is the actual delivery of the calf. So this is where that calf moves through the birth canal, that cervix is completely dilated. You might see membranes or the water bag become visible and she starts to have those increased abdominal contractions. This can happen anywhere from 30 minutes up to four hours. I get this question a lot on when should we call for help? So my rule of thumb is if I haven't seen any progression during stage two labor. So if I'm watching a cow and I see a water bag and her abdominal contractions are increasing significantly, but there is no sign of a calf, I'm gonna check her. Usually I'm gonna give her 30 minutes or so before I go in. But again, if I have something in my gut that says that might not be quite right, then, I, then it's okay to check her beforehand. Now, if this was a heifer, I would be waiting an hour mainly because heifers aren't sure what's going on. This is their first time having a calf. A lot of those membranes have not been stretched out yet, and, and she just doesn't sometimes sit down and think about pushing that calf. So I usually give her about an hour. The biggest key is that we are seeing progression. If you do see the abdominal con contractions start to increase, and then you see the feet, and you'll start to see a nose, and she's going, then I would leave her be. But if you just don't see any change, then definitely intervene. And again, if you just feel like something's off, it's not the wrong idea to just go ahead and, and check her out. The other reason to call for help would be if you get her in there and you check her out and then you realize you have an abnormal presentation. This is just a, a very small sampling of different presentations that could happen in a calf. Remember the normal way that a calf is born would be two front feet and a head, kind of like it's diving out. So that would be the, the normal position. If you feel anything other than that, or you're not comfortable, you think that maybe it's coming normally, but there's just not a lot of room, it's never a bad idea to call for help. So the third stage of labor is going to be the delivery of the placenta. Technically, this is called 12 hours after birth of that calf. If they have not delivered that placenta, then it's, then it's considered retained. Previously, it was always taught that we should manually remove these placentas, where we go in and we start to pull off the placenta from the uterus, from those buttons. But recent research has shown that that's creating more of an issue than it is helping. Think of it like a bunch of little um, micro abrasions that are being set up inside that uterus that now has the perfect environment for bacteria. Uh, bacteria increases significantly when we do manual removal. These cows get sick more often and then we're going to lead to issues with breeding back. So there could be scarring down in that uterus and then they just be, they won't be able to get rebred the following year. So I always say, don't, just don't touch the cow unless she looks like she's sick. Treatment really is only needed if for some reason that cow gets a fever, if she goes off feed, if her milk production goes down or her calf's not doing well, then that would be a time that we want to talk about treatment. But again, this is a situation and a plan that you need to have with your veterinarian so that you know when it is important to call for help. So after calving, we're going to just discuss a few things that could cause some emergencies, and the biggest issue would be prolapses. There's two different prolapses that I want to cover tonight, the first one being a vaginal prolapse. Most of the time, this can be found by a, a volleyball, basketball-sized pink mass, um, and it could be either before or after calving. It could be caused by multiple things. We do know that vaginal prolapses are genetic. Occasionally you'll see this in cows as the calf starts to get later in gestation. There's a lot of weight that's being pushed on that tissue and they'll prolapse it either in and out before calving. But it could also be caused by nutritional issues. 
there is some issues in some obesity uh, of cows. There, there's a lot of fat in that birth canal that can cause some, some problems keeping that tissue inside. And then also illness, if she's been coughing or straining, that will lead to prolapses. The, the big picture is these are difficult to manage. They are a very big time con commitment to you, especially if that cow has not calved yet because we need to make sure that that tissue goes back inside. So we'll usually put in a stitch to hold the tissue in, but the bad thing is, is that stitch also holds a calf in. So you need to watch her extremely close before calving to be able to cut that stitch so the calf can be born. And then a lot of times the tissues around the, the vaginal vault are swollen or friable and the calf has a hard time being delivered anyway. So the bottom line is I always recommend putting these girls on the call list because it's just a headache that we don't need to deal with. Now, if you have see this after a calf has been born, this is an emergency. This is her uterus, so or calf bed has been, you know, it shouldn't be outside of the cow. That definitely needs to be inside. So you need to call your veterinarian right away. A couple tricks so that you know what you're looking at between vaginal and uterine prolapse. I always ask, how much is hanging out? What's the size? So if you get a uterine prolapse and you've got it like hanging down to the hocks then we've, you know, that's, that's an emergency. If there's a lot more than just a little bubble, this is a uterus and this, this needs to be fixed immediately. The other thing is if you see those buttons. So the caruncles, which is, just, is the button on the uterus, if that's there and you can visualize them, um, then we know that we have an emergency situation and you need to call your veterinarian. It's really important to not move this cow if you haven't done it already. Uh, it, the, the artery that goes into the uterus is the size of a garden hose. And if we get her stressed, um, she's already very, very shocky, but if we get her stressed and she goes to take off, unfortunately I have seen these, these uteruses break off and then the cow will bleed to death. So we want to keep her as calm as possible. A couple tricks, if she's a calm cow and she's not going to be more stressed out by this, would be to possibly throw a, a lariat or a halter on her, dally her to the fence or a side-by-side. -side. If you have some panels, you can put it around her. But honestly, most of the time, these girls are so shocky that they aren't going to get up anyway. So just let her be. Call your veterinarian until they come to help you. Now, these girls may not need to be called afterwards. If this is a situation where you pulled a calf yourself and she just strained too much and the uterus came out right afterwards and the cow was confined and we got it cleaned and put back in, she may breed back next year with no problem. We obviously need to keep an eye on her, but it's not something that you need to make an immediate decision if it was, if it was a, a, clean, a clean procedure and you got it replaced quickly. The last thing to, that I wanted to talk about tonight would be hypothermic calves. So hypothermia would just be anything below 100 degrees is usually what I classify as needing help. Remember that the normal temperature of a calf is between 101.5 and 102.5. If we get down to 100 or below, that calf is having an issue of regulating its temperature. The biggest thing to remember is that a wet calf equals a cold calf. So it can be 20 degrees out and sunny with no wind and that's, you know, that's tropical compared to 40 degrees and a, and a driving uh, wet rain. So if, if that calf is wet and can't have the ability to get dried, we need to, to assist. The other thing, again, remember the technique of sticking your fingers in its mouth and just checking if it's cold. And then obviously just look for demeanor. Look for vigor in that calf. If it just looks depressed and you just feel like we're not getting the right amount of movement or you know it just looks a little lifeless, then it's, it's time to get in. Use your gut and help that calf out. There's a couple different ways to warm a calf up. You can use a, a commercial calf hut, which are convenient. Um, they're a nice big hut with a, um, with a mat inside, and you can put the calf in and plug it in, and then warm air will circulate around it. Um, you can use the floor bed of a truck. This picture here is actually one of my calves. Just I threw in the truck bed and cranked up the, the heater on the floor and let that circulate through until that calf was dried off. I like this method because I can drive right up to the calf and throw it in versus trying to get it back to the barn. But I've also used tubs of warm water. So this technique is, is helpful if you have a, an old mineral tub or a, a tank that's no longer being used and you have access to water around 100 degrees. You can actually fill that tub with it and submerge the calf, keeping its head up out of the water, of course. I usually will put a little calf halter on it to hold it up and then allow that water to circulate around the calf's body and that will help warm it externally. Couple things to remember. Never ever just throw a calf 
in one of these things and walk away. This is where your thermometer gets uh, very important. You want to make sure that you're constantly checking the temperature of that calf because you can actually go the opposite direction and become hyperthermic. Once that calf reaches about 99 degrees, 99 to 100, take them out of the heat source and they can usually self-regulate. The other thing that's really important to remember is these things can be a big source of bacteria. So if you have a sick calf that got put into your calf hut, it's a breeding ground for those pathogens with that warm air circulating. So it needs to be cleaned out after every calf to prevent added stress. So the other, the other thing to remember is that it's not just external warming that we do for these babies, but we also want to warm them from the inside out. And that's where that colostrum comes in. If you're using mom, it should be warmed what that baby would need immediately. So go ahead and milk out the cow and give it to the calf. If you're using a replacer, then make sure that you mix it with around 100 degrees water and go ahead and feed that to the calf. This also gives them that energy and that fat to get them going from the inside out. So in summary, I hope I gave you a good list of, of supplies and tools and some tricks to get this calving season off to the right start. Number one, make sure that you visit your veterinarian now. Go talk when it's not a stressful time um, before you get that first calf on the ground. Set up your plan, when is an emergency, what, what medications, if any, are needed, um, and, and what you're going to do if you do need help. Get your supplies stocked while you're there. Um, make sure that your calving toolbox is ready to go. Make sure that nothing's expired and everything's clean and that everyone knows where it's at. Ensure all those tools are clean and working. If you're using a calf jack, make sure that it didn't you know, get thrown in the corner all year and it's not dusty and dirty. Get that cleaned up. Make sure your, calving, your tube feeder is clean as well. Get your calving area ready to go. This is a simple thing to do before it gets really stressful if you have an area that's, that doesn't have any animals in it now. Just make sure that when you do need it that it's ready to put that calf in there. And finally, make sure everybody on your team is educated. Make sure everyone understands the plan and we're doing things the same way. Uh, that will just ensure that you have a successful calving season. So hopefully these, these tips and tricks are here to help you. I want to see you be successful as we get through this exciting time of calving. Thank you.